trying to play the intro. Oh, well. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Let me try again. Wow, the intro doesn't want to play. Okay, so I'm going to have to say it. Do take care. This is a knitting and stitching and getting together with friends who are enthused about true crime. We are making a blanket and... I just want to say that if you are someone who has a problem with triggers, that you should take care for this one. And I don't mind at all if you have to back out because you cannot handle the subject matter. So there is my my little intro. Since I didn't get to play my intro, it's not wanting to play for some reason. I am on Google Chrome. So I don't know if that's any different. It shouldn't be, but you never know. So let's see. Hello, hello. We have Kimberly. How are you, Kimberly? We have Alicia B. Thank you so much. Guys, you do not even know how much Alicia B. has helped me today. This week, this whole week, she has done some deep diving, and I appreciate it. Hello, Mrs. Kelly. Hi, Chelsea. That's my daughter, Chelsea. There's Denny. I call her Denny Benenny. <laughs> She's like been my number one fan from the very, very beginning. She's an OG. Hello, Sandy. Diamond Girl is here. How are you? Who else? Wendy Joe is here. Maureen is here. How are you? Be careful. We're getting thunderstorms. Nothing serious, just thunderstorms for us. Hello, Lisa. Hi, Mary. How are you tonight? Hello, Karen. I got my true crime junkie pin. You guys see this? Um, Amber made this for me. Yay, you did. You made it. <laughs> Lori, did I say hi? Thank you so much for being here, my friend. Shirley Spring is here. Kim Anderson, hi. Hey, Linda. <laughs> Shad is here. Whoop, whoop. Shad, I've got, I've got a necklace on tonight. So today, today it's rainbows for Naomi. I will tell you what I mean in a minute if you do not know, but okay, I'm caught up. Whoop, whoop. I may not have gotten to read all of the comments, but I did at least say hello to everybody, I hope. And for those of you that are watching, lurking, absolutely so glad you are here too. For those of you that are watching this back, thank you so very, very much. I appreciate that as well. Okay, this one, you guys, is going to be an overview it is going to be the beginning in a series of stuff coming because it, there really is no way right now that um, I can cover it all in one sitting. There's just not any way. But I did want to clarify a few things that have started to be my understanding of, of the case. Oh, you got snow. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I'm kind of letting everybody come in. I do have a slideshow for you guys of the blankets that everybody has been making. Now, this is for the first quarter of our Stitch in Crime blanket, Mal. If somebody could put the hashtag in there for me, I would appreciate it. Stitch in Crime blanket, Mal. And I've got the, I, I put together a slideshow of all the blankets I could find, all the ones I could find. It is, I cut my hair today. <laughs> it, I was tired of it. So I got the, 
I got the clippers out and thank you. So I know a lot of people come and want to see my hair. I have people actually that want to see it. It's so funny, but I understand because it looks different all the time. It's just I have that kind of hair. I'm very blessed. I'm very, very blessed with my hair. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Sharon. So since Mr. Fiber and I had... And I do believe we had COVID. We did not. Hi, Froggy. I saw your video today, girl. You got some good stuff the other day. And Sue, um, my hair is falling out. Now, I have a lot of hair, as you can see. I'm not going to go bald anytime soon. It's doing, doing fine. Hello, Jean. But... I think that in tandem with it falling out is also a problem where I'm having where my scalp has been really been sore and itchy. Whether I put anything in it or I don't. And, but a lot of the gels and stuff that I was using before that I could use, I can't use now. So it's been a thing. There was time to just cut my hair and see how, and, and it does feel better today. It does feel a lot better. My scalp has calmed down quite a bit just from the haircut and um, I switched shampoos and a different, um, it's a, a gel that doesn't have a whole lot of additives in it. So that being said, all about my hair, <laughs> I'm glad y'all like it. Oh, and y'all, I want y'all to help me pick the next color because I'm ready to add a color to my blanket. And we are going to pick, we are going to pick a winner tonight. So let me show you guys what I've got. I made some scrap cakes. I've got my little ball sack that I made. This way. In a red heart camo. So there's this one. Y'all forgive me with the dog hair. You know how it is. Yes. This one starts with a purple. Chelsea, I know you want that one. I know Chelsea wants that one. Somebody else needs to vote too, though. <laughs> and all of these other, like a cranberry. And you see there's like a some browns in there, these oranges, and then it goes to all this where I held this stuff together. <clears throat> so that's one. And we've got this one, which is like a pink. And then it goes, there's a teal. And then it goes into the rainbow. That's two. One, two. Wait. One, two. We've got this one, which is a bulky, and it's got a, the teal in the middle. This is the one I did my cowl out of. And then there's this um, heavy bulky on the around it. So that one won't last very long. That's three. Four is this one, which got like a, a blue and pink, and then it goes to like these two different color pinks together. That's four. And number five is this one, which is like a cream and blue. Denny used to get some of these. Mr. Fiber used to make these for me all the time. Well, I did them this time. So what do y'all like? Hi, Delphine. Uh-oh, Wendy Jo said purple also. That's two. I got one for the rainbow. That one, the rainbow. I know they're all pretty. I could just... Somebody said the blue one. Okay, Delphine. She's popping in and out. I have. I absolutely have because I do know exactly what you mean. And I may, I may have to do that at, um, although I do have coconut oil, I probably could do that instead of the cholesterol. I was labeling them by the number. So one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> oh, 
Okay, I'm probably missing all the votes. I got lots of them for the rainbows. Are y'all talking about this one? Can y'all give me a, a... Yeah, I'm seeing lots of those. <laughs> Denny. <laughs> I see lots of ones and five. Ones and fives. One and five. But the rainbow is not going to be for a while. It's going to be this for a while. And I started with the rainbow. Is Lamone here? Hey, Lamone. And Joyce and Cheryl's here, kind of lurking. Okay, this is number five. You know what? It would be different, wouldn't it? Guess we'll go with that. We'll go with number five. We'll do number, we'll do this one next. Okay, this is the, this is the, I was waiting for more people to be here. Before I tell you about this case, you guys, we're going to be on this for a little bit. And the reason I say that is because this is just not going to be an easy thing to cover in one, one time. But mainly what I want to tell you about, my main reason for covering this case, okay, is because of Texas EquiSearch. Now, I want to say thank you to Alicia B. I know you're not the only one that likes purple. I know. I know, because you know how to do that color. I know you do. So, just so you guys know, I don't always get what I'm talking and, and doing um, videos and all that stuff. I don't always get to talk to you while... Uh, while I do this. So I, it's not that I'm ignoring anybody, but I am watching my notes. So y'all just um, bear with me. Okay. I'm so glad you're all here. So there we go. I added it in. Some of you purple people are disappointed, but it's coming. We'll get to it. So EquiSearch is a nonprofit here in Texas. It started here in Texas and it started because the own, the, the man who started the, the, the company, his daughter went missing and his daughter was found in a field that has been called the Texas killing fields. So for those of you coming in and are not really sure what we're talking about, this is a crime knitting and crime podcast. So there may be some disturbing things. And so if you are triggered, this is a, another warning for you. So I want to play for you. I have a video where I show you um, about Texas EquiSearch. There is the Texas EquiSearch and there's also an EquiSearch Midwest. And we'll talk about that too. But Lauren Miller, when she went missing, she was found in a field. And that field became a part of a bigger case of mostly put out there by the media, I have learned, called the Texas Killing Fields. But the place where she was found was on Calder Road. So she's actually one of this weather may get my phone, may take my phone. I don't know. It may take either one of us. <laughs> I've got thunderstorms in the area, you guys. I am sorry if I don't get to uh if I don't get to stay. I'll do as much as I can. Okay, now I want to play for you um, an introduction to Texas EquiSearch.
hopefully. I wanted to bring your attention to the About page at Texas EquiSearch, Search and Recovery, Lost is Not Alone. So this is the story that is on their page. There's Laura Miller, and it says about the Texas EquiSearch, they mounted a search and recovery team that started in August of 2000 with the purpose to provide volunteer horse mounted search and recovery for lost and missing persons. The team was started in the North Galveston County area because of the high incidence of missing persons in the largely undeveloped area of South Harris and North Galveston counties. With this in mind, the team's existence and purpose is dedicated to the memory of Laura Miller, the daughter of our founding director, Tim Miller. Laura was abducted and murdered in North Galveston County in 1984. Our team is composed of volunteers of various experiences, with many being experienced horse owners. We currently have approximately 1,000 plus members and are growing rapidly. We are currently available to conduct searches nation and worldwide. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, which is funded solely by donations. You will find our organization to be compassionate, dedicated, and professional. We believe that we better ourselves by working together to help the community and people in need. Many of our members are trained in various rescue and life-saving skills, such as CPR, advanced life-saving skills, and field craft. Our members come from all walks of life, consisting of business owners, medics, firefighters, housewives, electricians, students, former FBI and law enforcement, current law enforcement, former horse and rider teams, to foot searchers and ATVs. We conduct water searches using boats, divers, and sonar equipment. Additionally, we perform air searches using planes, helicopters, and small drone airplanes with highly sophisticated cameras. We have also utilized infrared and night vision cameras, along with ground penetrating units in some of our searches. Texas EquiSearch has more resources than most law enforcement agencies, which allows law enforcement to conduct their investigation, while Texas EquiSearch conducts organized searches. This has worked out to be a great working relationship between law enforcement and Texas EquiSearch. This has also resulted in Texas EquiSearch being contacted by law enforcement agencies across the nation to assist them in their missing persons cases. Texas EquiSearch has been involved in 1,860 plus searches in approximately 42 states in the United States, Aruba, Sri Lanka, Mexico, Jamaica, Dominican Republic, and Nicaragua. Our efforts have proven successful with returning over 400 missing per people home to their families safely, many of which would have been deceased. Texas EquiSearch is responsible for recovering the remains of 238 missing loved ones, bringing closure to many families. Many of the 238 cases have resulted in criminal cases. At no time during any of the searches was evidence compromised by Texas EquiSearch. Therefore, the suspects were brought to justice, resulting in convictions. Additionally, Mr. Miller has been involved in several murder trials. Our director, Tim Miller, has been featured on Court TV's Crime Library, a profile of Tim Miller and Texas EquiSearch by Dr. Katherine Ramsland. Dr. Ramsland has published 27 books and currently teaches forensic psychology at DeSales University in Pennsylvania. Dr. Kathleen Ramsland has written a truly tremendous and comprehensive article on Tim Miller and Texas EquiSearch. In addition to a detailed account of Tim, the volunteers and the ser searches for missing persons in an attempt to provide closure for the many grieving families. Closure is so very important, so at least the healing process can begin. Additionally, Larry King Live, Fox News Nation, Greta Van Susteren, CBS 48 Hours Mystery, CNN, HLN, Nancy Grace, Glenn Beck, People Magazine, Newsweek, Evidence Technology, Dateline, 
2020, Texas Horse Talk, and all the local news stations have all featured the works of Texas EquiSearch and Tim Miller's experience in the searches of lost loved ones. Tim Miller is also the recipient of the Point of Light Award by George W. Bush. He received the Jefferson Award from the City of Houston, the Foundation for the Improvement of Justice in, Justice in Atlanta, Georgia. Additionally, the Texas Daughters of American Revolution Community Service Award, the National Daughters of the American Revolutionary Community Service Reward Award, Crime Stoppers of Houston, and countless other awards from all over the nation. Mr. Miller was invited by George H.W. Bush Jr. and attended the first conference for the National Missing and Exploited Children in Washington, D.C., and also the signing of the National Amber Alert in Washington, D.C. He has also been the keynote speaker for the National Conference for Parents of Murdered Children, along with being a keynote speaker for many law enforcement conferences across the country. Mr. Miller has received countless awards from across the nation. On the About page under Board of Directors, here is a picture of Tim Miller, founder and director, and there is a brief synopsis about Tim Miller. There's the other people who are on the board. So you can go through and look at those. Uh, Tim Miller started Texas EquiSearch Mounted Search and Recovery Team in August 2000 with the purpose to provide volunteer horse mounted search and, res search and recovery for lost and missing persons. The team's existence and purpose is dedicated to the memory of Laura Miller, the daughter of our founding director. So a little bit more, but similar to what I read to you earlier. That's the chairman of the board. This is Jeff Ruby. Uh, Datron, who's secretary. Ken DeFore. Andy Cohen. There's media and publication. Honors and awards. Lots of different things under this about. Now, if we go over here to where it says case files, you can see where there are active cases. There are some that are found safe. We have memorials. We have cold cases. There's information here about at-risk populations. So oftentimes they're asked to find someone who has Alzheimer's or dementia or autism. Here is a place where you can request help on a case. We go to the active cases. There's one here in Houston, Levin Gerson Rivario, 34 of Houston, Carolyn Gaddis of League City. That's down where all of the things happened with Laura Miller. Elsa Ferreira, Houston, Casey Ann Price, San Leon. You can go look at, at these also, you guys. So this one is um, Jennifer Dozier Jones. Um, it says here that there has been an update. It was updated on the 7th of this month and she has been found deceased. Here's a little boy that was found safe, Curly. So there is a place up here where you can become a member and it tells you how to do that. There is a place to donate, and it tells you how to do that. There's actually a donate button. So I would encourage you guys to go over and take a look at Texas EquiSearch and see what else there is. Take a look around. Yeah, so that gives you an overview of, of that. So. I just wanted to share that with you guys and make you understand why, why I'm covering this. And there was mention of duty, Ron, and that is where I learned even more. I had heard of EquiSearch, um, didn't know a whole lot about it, but I had heard of it before. And 
you know, on the news and because I, I, I watch true crime stuff and he, and there's been, he's been covered on some stuff, but so in passing, but it just didn't sink in until I saw him on duty Ron. And, um, I was actually able to be on screen with duty Ron and Ed Wallace, his co-host and with, Dave Rader. Now, Dave Rader runs the EquiSearch Midwest with Twyla. And um, Twyla is a, the coordinator, one of the, their coordinators of that, of that branch. It's a branch of EquiSearch. And Dave Rader became involved in it on the Casey Anthony with little Kaylee. He became involved on that case. And I want to cover that as well. But know that both links will be down below where you can go and take a look at the organizations, both Texas EquiSearch and EquiSearch Midwest. <sighs> yeah. So a lot of people found out about it and didn't realize that it actually started in, in Texas, I guess. So they have to be invited by law enforcement. They sometimes will be, um, the families will contact them. The family contacted them for the Naomi Erion case. However, they had that, um, that part of Nevada had their own search and rescue. The FBI wasn't already involved with it. And so they, they were working, they were all working really well together there. And um, so the, the law enforcement had not contacted EquiSearch to ask them to come in and help. So that is why they did not get involved. But yes, um, the Naomi Erion case is very sad. And this happened in Nevada. And I will cover that a little bit more next week because I'm going to do a round table and we are going to, we'll talk more about that. Thank you, Alicia B. Alicia B is also a moderator for Duty Ron, so she knows quite a bit about him if you have some questions. And again, I thank her very much for the for a lot of these notes that I'm about to read to you. So here is the first information we have. Now, this is I really looked and looked for more things about. Laura, because I wanted to know more about her, but I couldn't find very much as far as who she was and what she, you know, the, the family moved to League City, Texas in the 80s. I believe they moved, I'm thinking they moved there in 84 or late 83. I was still trying to find that also. <clears throat> But she was born on July 17, 1968. So she would have been a couple of years younger than me right now. She was last seen on, the, on September the 10th of 1984. The place that she was last seen was at the gas station, which is now, that it's still there, but it's now a Valero. And it was at West Street and Hobbs there in League City. Now, if, not, if you guys do not know, League City is South Texas. So we're talking about you leave Houston and you head out and you'll get to League City. So Laura was very musically gifted. And it was unfortunate because she was frustrated. She was a straight A student, but she started experiencing very debilitating seizures. And she was on a lot of medication. It made her very depressed. She was going through a lot of really hard stuff. There, there are some reports that she might have even tried to commit suicide a couple of times. 
and she was starting to hang out with some kids that she really shouldn't have been hanging out with. There was also some talk that she was into drugs for a little while. Not into them, but that she had experimented. Let's put it that way. Now, the police initially considered her a runaway. You know, she's a teenager, so she's a runaway. She's not missing. She's a runaway. That's what seems to go on a lot. So her father, Tim Miller, who was the founder of EquiSearch, he went off, started investigating on his own. There's some reports that say that her mom drove her to the gas station. She wanted to go and call some friends. And I, I think she was supposed to go call her boyfriend at the gas station to use the phone, you know, back when there were pay phones. <laughs> and um, then there are other reports that say she walked there by herself. Since they had not been in this house for very long, they had not, you know, they moved there, but they hadn't been there for very long. They, they didn't have their phone hooked up yet. So that's why she had to go and go to the, this gas station to use the phone. Now, on a side note, one of the other victims, her name is Heidi Fye, she was last seen at the same payphone. She was found, her body was found 60 feet from Laura's in the field. On February 4th, 1986, parents, the parents read of the body that was found in the field and they went down, they, they weren't contacted. They read that somebody had found a body. They went down and they took Laura's dental records down there to the police department. Now, Tim Miller has said that Clyde Hedrick lived down the same down on the same street, down the street for them, just a few houses down. Before before they moved to League City, oh, my lights are blinking. Sorry, I'm hesitating because my lights are blinking. We're getting there's more rain. So Laura's boyfriend at the time said that Laura had bought drugs from Clyde Hedrick, that she had bought marijuana from him at least once. So this is a person that lived there. This is a person of interest, and we'll get to him in a little bit. I know the things that we did and never had any problem using pay phones. Now, I do want to mention there are four, four women that were found and that were connected to the Calder Road field. They were all found in that field and they were all connected to that area. Their cases were caught up in this entire area of what they were calling the killing fields. So theirs get talked about quite a bit, but they were found on Calder Road and there is a memorial there now. And their names are Heidi Fye, Laura Miller, Audrey Cook, and Donna Prudhomme. Now, Audrey Cook and Donna Prudhomme were not identified until later. But those are the four that are considered the Calder Road murders. Okay, now I do have a picture. Let me see if I can show you. There's all y'all's blankets. So 
So here is the timeline. This is a, a rough timeline and we will be getting into this a lot more down the road, okay? But for now, this gives you a little bit of an overview. So we've got another person of interest early on was Robert Abel and he moved to League City in June of 1983. Heidi Fye was last seen October of 83. She was found April of 84. Ellen Beeson dies in 84. Laura Miller was last seen in September of 84. In August of 1985, Clyde Hedrick was convicted of abuse of a corpse, and that was of Ellen Beeson. And I'm, I'm a, I'm, I'll give you some more information on this. December of 1985, Audrey Cook was last seen. February 86, Jane Doe was found. And see, she turned out to be Audrey Cook. February of 86, Laura Miller was found. So, Heidi was found in April of 84, and Laura was found in February of 86. Right? She was found when they found Jane Doe, but they didn't know who she was at that time. Donna Prudholm was last, had last spoke to her sister in 1989. Tim Miller had decided that Robert Abel was guilty. And he went a little crazy, pulled him out of his home and threatened him. He was convinced it was him. In 1999, Robert Abel was identified publicly as the prime spectator suspect and he moves out of League City. Then in July of 91, Donna Prudhomme was last seen. Jane Doe was found in 91 in uh, September. Tim Miller starts EquiSearch in 2000. In July of 05, Abel dies in a golf cart train accident. Clyde Kendrick is arrested for the murder of Ellen Beeson in April of 2000, April 13th of year 2000. Audrey Cook and Donna Prudholm were identified in January of 2019. That's August of 15 and April of 13. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm saying that's 2000, but that's 2013, 15, 19. Okay. Whew. That gives you guys a, that's just that's just a very small portion of all of the things that were going on in this area. I've got to get a drink. I want to do a little bit more and then I want to play the I want to play the slideshow for you guys. So hold on. Okay, that's the timeline. I'm just trying to decide. I tell you what. Okay. I've got a video. There's so much to this case. It 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 is very confusing and I'm going to have to really work on it. We're this is going to take us more than one time to do this. I want to share Now you guys, when I am sharing screen, I cannot see your comments, so just bear with me. 
Um, okay. Think of where I'm going here. There's the will and aims. Now we are going here. And it's going to be. Oh, it's not in there. Now, I'm not going to play this whole thing. I'm just going to play a portion of it. Vehicle beside the road was a store and immediately backpedal, or they would take their daughters and hide them in a different aisle. You couldn't help but wonder, is this the guy? Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm still here. <laughs> I know. Um, oh, I'm getting a phone call. That's my dad. I, somehow I knew he would call. Y'all hold on because I may lose my hands. Can y'all still hear me okay? You see that? It's shaking because my dad's trying to call me. Hello to those I missed while I was playing the video. Yeah, it's, it was just awful. Now, okay. We are at, we're talking about Robert Abel now. And this does relate to um, Tim Miller's case because he thought Robert Abel was guilty. Hi, Kim. Okay, thank you. Okay, Nick, is all still hear me and you're still seeing my hands. I think we're okay. Looks like there might be, I don't know, there's some sort of a, a message up there, but I'm not going to worry about it. So, the, the Mr. Abel had a, what do you call it? Um, a sta he had some stables right there by the field. And the FBI, they had a profile. And in their profile, they said, and we hear this pretty often, don't you think? Because we heard this in the Delphi murders. We heard this in, in a lot of different things. The FBI profiler profiled that the killer would be, he would live close to the scene insert himself into the investigation, provide false leads, keep trophies, be preoccupied with the crimes, have multiple romantic partners, exhibit cruelty to animals, careful planner, superior intelligence, skilled imposter, preferred working in his comfort zone, and had a location which had little interference. Now, Robert Abel was a young NASA scientist at the time. He had a top secret security clearance. He was a, had a graduate degree from the University of Texas in Austin. He lived a half a mile from Heidi and Laura, he was repeatedly questioned. 
He pro proper his property was searched, including cadaver dogs. He per had purchased eleven acres next to the humble oil field for his Stardust Trail rides, which had sales of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in nineteen ninety one. In 1989, he was married to Cindy Jacobs for 41 days. While on his honeymoon in Germany, she denied him sex, and he told her if she did that again, he'd kill her. She came home and filed for divorce. In 1990, he married Paula Myers. They separated in 1992. Ironically, he dated Paula before Cindy and then married her after Paula told police she was afraid of him. That he had fits of rage, would leave her for a week at a time after an argument. Also said she saw pics of nude women in his desk. She further claimed that she saw him beat his horses with pipes and chains and that left dead livestock to rot in the pasture. Paula encouraged Cindy to talk to the police, and Cindy said that she saw nude pics of women in his possession, and she saw him exhibit anger towards the horses. I know, 41 days, right? In November of 1993, the search of Abel's property yielded no viable evidence. However, they did find a news article of the crime, also an article in the Houston Chronicle that was detailing the life of a ser serial killer. So some really creepy stuff in there. Abel was interviewed by Skip Hollinsworth. That's the guy you just heard talking. Of the Tex of Texas reporter for Texas Monthly and you, you heard him say he felt uneasy. Some facts that came out include a box with a photo album of the places each body was found labeled Robert Abel, which he brushed off as from his private investigator. You know, serial killers do keep a scrapbook. Just saying. Abel claimed he couldn't have committed the crimes because he had a torn rotator cuff at the time that some of those girls turned up dead, that he had a rotator cuff injury. So there was no way he could have done that. And he couldn't have picked him up or have overpowered him or taken him to his car and hauled him off in his car and carried him out and put him in the, and, and Skip said, you know, that's a lot more information than just, no, I couldn't have done it. He denied all statements made by Paula and Cindy and said that he didn't, that he didn't carry a gun. Abel inserted himself into the investigation by allowing the police to use his horses during the search for evidence of a fourth body. He also offered his backhoe and made suggestions to the investigator. Later in 97, he again made suggestions to a new police investigator that the retention pond was never searched. The retention pond on his property. Abel remained in League City until 1999. He closed his ranch, sold or moved his horses, and re returned to a family property in Bellevue, Belleville, which is in Texas. And... In July of 2005, he drove his golf cart onto a railroad track and was killed. Now, that was ruled an accident. There was no proof that he did that on purpose. Yeah, he didn't yeah, know. He's a creepy guy for sure. And Tim Miller, he pounded him. I'm telling you, he pounded him. Um, he talks about that in that, that one I was just um, reading to you. 
Okay. Let's have a break. <laughs> Take a deep breath, y'all. And let me play you. Let me play you the slideshow of the blankets. It's not very long. So, but it'll be a nice, nice break here, I think. Here we go. There's no music. That's a pretty pattern, Deneen, really is. Now, Jeannie has a couple different pictures. These are all the same blanket she's been working on, but I wanted you guys to see closer pictures. I don't think she's here. I didn't see her come in. I forget what that one's called. That one is so pretty. And this one is a scrap blanket. It turned out so pretty. I mean, I think it's a scrap blanket. Not sure. And Lori, this mosaic, OMG. And I don't think that Maureen comes over, but she put this in the Facebook group. I love that one. I'm still wanting to do that one. Right? Look how pretty. <laughs> she sent that to me. She goes, Teal. <laughs> Did Lisa the Grammy come in? Is she here? Are you here, Lisa? All right. Well done, everybody. <laughs> It's always so much fun when we put it into those, you know, into the uh, slideshow. I know that is so pretty. Oh, so you're using scrap yarn for that. Oh, that's cool. That's so cool. Mm -mm. Okay, now... I need to share my screen again. I think the storms have passed, you guys. Oh, you didn't? I put, there were three of them in there. They were there, Sandy. I promise. Okay, here we go, guys. I've already got everybody in the wheel of names here. I'm going to hit the shuffle button again. And you can see here we've got Lisa the Grammy. Here's Red Heart Crochet. You're in there. Bella, Marie, Wendy Jo, Jeannie, Lori. I should have, Cheryl, I did not put you in here. 
And I was just thinking that I need to put Cheryl. Do you guys think I should put Cheryl in here? Trust me, I'll give her something. She'll get something. Okay. Wait. How did I lose my the page that I was on? I stop sharing. I got to do it again because I lost it. Everybody says to add Cheryl. There it is. Okay. Okay, I added Cheryl. I must hit the shuffle again. There we go. Are you ready? Let's find out who the winner is for the first quarter of the Scrap in Crime Blanket Make Along. Jeannie. <laughs> I did never see. Did she come in? Jeannie is the winner. <laughs> awesome. Jeannie Terranova, you're the winner for the first. That's for the first quarter, you guys. Yay. <laughs> That gives at least gives something not quite so heavy right here in the middle of all this. And that way, if we don't get too much more done, then at least we've done that. So send me, when you see this, Jeannie, if you're not here, send me a email at firefluzycrafts at gmail.com and let me know that you saw this. Y'all, did you see Natalie saw hers from last, uh, was it last night? No. Night before last. It was so funny. I knew she would be like, what? She was so surprised. Y'all know I'm double fisting it tonight. I've got my Sprite and I got my coffee. Oh, Chelsea's making squares, you guys. She's really embracing the crochet. She says she can get stuff done a lot faster. <laughs> we know this, right? <laughs> Knitting does take a lot longer. All right, where do I go? There we go. It is rarely light and breezy, but I like to kind of keep it, you know, take a little break. <laughs> okay. Now, I wanted to tell you something about the other ladies that were found at this location. Now, Heidi Fi, her name was Heidi Villarreal Fi. She was born April of 1958. She was last seen October of 1983 at that same gas station that Laura was seen at. Now, you know, Laura was in September, right? Of 80, was it September 84? It's just, um, normally, now what I'm doing here working with a four weight yarn goes fairly quickly, but a lot of knitting requires you to knit across, like if you're making a garment and stuff, you know, you knit across and you have to purl back. Purling takes longer than knitting. So it kind of, in a lot of things, you are doing a lot, lot more stitches in the same amount of space that you do less stitches of in crochet. That's kind of the gist of it. <laughs> so Heidi was the youngest of six kids. She was 25 at the time that she disappeared. She was a cocktail waitress 
bartender. Interestingly, the bar where Clyde Hendrick would go. There's some confusion about why she left her parents' house. Some reports say to hitchhike to her boyfriend's place in Houston, and others say to use the phone. She was last seen at the phone. So it's kind of confusing. It is reported that the police insinuated that her career played a role in her death. So loose woman, bartender, doing drugs, blah, blah, blah. That's why she died, right? She has ties to Laura Miller through the gas station and Ellen Beeson the Clyde Hedrick, yeah, Ellen Beeson, because they hang out, hung out at the same club with Clyde Edwin Hedrick that was called the Texas Moon Club, and it's no longer in business. Now, like Laura Miller, Audrey Cook and Donna Prudhomme, she was found in the humble oil field under a tree. The, her cause of death is unknown. She did have some broken ribs, so there's some conjecture that she was beaten to death. She was found when her skull was located by a neighborhood dog who brought it home to his owners, and that house was 300 yards from where her body was discovered. But that was Heidi Fye. Now she was, she was identified and Laura was identified. The two that were not identified right away were Audrey Cook and who was considered Jane Doe and Janet Doe, who was Donna Gonzalez Hastings, but went by Donna Prudholm. Now Audrey Cook was born the 25th of November, 1955. She was last seen December of 1985. She was found February of 1986. There were two boys on their bicycles and they smelled something. At the time, it was estimated she had been dead two to four weeks. There was a small caliber bullet in her spine. She was found 20 yards from Laura Miller, and that's what med to, led to Laura's discovery. She had two sons. Now, details about her are a bit sketchy. We know she worked as a mechanic for various businesses, including a golf cart company, a national rent-a-car, and Harrison Equipment Company. One of her friends indicated she bought and sold cocaine but this was not confirmed in anything official. She was, she was listed as Jane Doe until January of 2019. And then, and hello to those coming in. Donna Hastings or Prudhomme. See, Prudhomme is her sister's, her married sister's name, but she went by Prudhomme. You had some question about that, Alicia B., but I think she went by Prudhomme. So she was born the 23rd of April, 1957. She was last seen July 1991. She was found September 1991 and identified in 2019. She was located by two people riding a horse, possibly from the Starlight Ranch, which was owned by Robert Abel. Police found a belt, which they think was used to tie her to a tree while being assaulted. Her body was badly decomposed when found. There were injuries to her upper spine, which might have been the cause of death. She had also been struck in the face by a flat object resulting in a broken jaw 
and cheek. She also had poorly healed rib fractures, so she was beat. They, somebody beat the crap out of her, okay? They beat the crap out of her. She was married to an abusive man whom she left and had two sons. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play you something about that in here in a minute, more about that. Okay. I have a clip here from the FBI. Yeah, it was confusing, but I think she went by Prude Home. I'm pretty sure I saw that in the when they identified them in that clip. Thank you for those of you that are still here and are sticking with me. I really appreciate it. All right. I got stuff stuck everywhere, y'all. Give me a minute to find it. This is known as the Calder Road killings or the killing fields. There were, there were four victims found uh, throughout the years. chose this area uh, gives us a couple little tidbits of insight. It was, it's such a remote rural area. Somebody had to know about that place. What we're looking for is some um, anomalies that exist between all four girls. If, if there's one person that, that knew all the girls or one person that was seen with the girls, that of course would be a, a great um, great lead for us but any anything that anybody in the public knows anything no matter how small they think it is we really want them to come forward because it may be very significant to us even though they think it's just a, a small tidbit that doesn't have any meaning yeah, i think about laura every day i miss her and uh it's always going to be that empty plate at the dinner table but you know, our death wasn't in vain. It wasn't in vain, I'm like, because that still isn't difficult. I would go out there where Laura's body was found, and, uh, and I would walk up to her cross. I put my hand on her cross, and I say, Laura, please don't hate your daddy, but I can't come out here anymore. I have to say goodbye. And I have to put my life back together. And I'd literally be walking away and I hear this little voice said, Dad, don't go away, please don't think. I'm going to fight to my dying breath to do what I can do to make sure whoever murdered Laura and the other girls uh, justice is served. The fact it hasn't been solved doesn't mean it's not being worked and doesn't mean it's not being worked diligently. It just means that we're not getting the breaks that we need at this point. We need to go further and, and find the killer, bring him to justice. And I think that would, 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 would heal a lot of wounds in the community.
I was at work and one of the girls said, Miss Diane, your phone is going off. And when I went and looked at it, I had two calls from my cousin and then a text that said, call ASAP. And when I called her, she said, where are you? I said, I'm at work. She said, go outside. I said, okay, I'm outside. And she said, Diane, I just got off the phone with the detective Tisdale from the League City Police Department. And I knew, I mean, my knees fell out. Gina started to tell me they found her. I, said, I don't want to know. Um, I didn't want to know any of it. I just was relieved. I was relieved. She had a pretty tough life. She loved to shrimp and crab and fish on the banks of the Sabine River. She loved her children so much. The bottom line to all this is no one deserves to die like she did. No one. It's very important for the public to know that we have not given up. You know, it may be labeled a cold case. That doesn't mean it's just sitting on a shelf not being worked. It's being worked actively at FBI. It's being actively worked at League City Police Department. And we have uh, other resources from other agencies that are helping out. I want everybody to know that nobody has given up on this case. And I want the offender to know, if he's watching, that we will come get you. So sad. Good night, Cheryl. Okay. Whew. It's so hard, but you know, that is what Tim says that he does. He wants to help people find their loved ones so that they can move on. They won't forget. You never forget. But he wants to help people to find their loved ones, bring them home, bring at least some closure to everything. How is everybody doing out there? <laughs> I always miss a lot of the comments when I'm doing these, and I do apologize if I have not said hello to you. I thank you for being here. 30 years, yeah. Well, you know, Eighties. Oh, good. It is. I mean, he could have completely fallen apart because as as hard as you can see that it hurts his heart every time he talks about her. Just to just to talk about it, you know, it's he could have just totally could have gone into a bottle somewhere or something, you know. Now, there were a couple more suspects I want to mention that were possible suspects. Um, it, this is, it, this is, it's all, yeah, I was going to say, I think it's 40 years. That's what I was thinking too, Alicia B. Oh, you're welcome, Karen. You're welcome. I've been wanting to do this for a while. I appreciate that. So there were two other suspects. Now, one of the, the other suspects in this case was Mark Roland Stallings. And he worked. He was very, very strange. He, con he actually confessed to the killings. Okay. It does not seem likely. He was 15 or 16 at the time. But he was a very strange, strange guy. At, at 11 years old, he stabbed another child. So he had a lot of issues. He also committed a rape at gunpoint. Not a, not a nice guy. And he worked for Robert Abel on his ranch. He claimed that he helped Abel find sex workers and that Abel murdered one. He claims to have murdered Donna to frame Abel. And he also said that Abel told him the murdered, gir murdered girls were visiting him. So, 
there's that. But that hasn't gone anywhere. So I'm guessing that the FBI, because of the things they've said since then, that they looked into him and decided that he was probably just popping off and was probably just a an odd, a creepy guy for sure. The one that is extremely interesting here is Clyde Hendrick. That's okay. It goes all year long, you guys. The make-along, we're going to do this all year long. Look how bright that made that. That really brightened up my, my um, blanket putting that in there. Well, I mean, a 15 or 16-year-old probably could have done it, but probably likely would not have been around them, I wouldn't think. Now, Clyde Kedrick, here's just a little bit about him. Other inmates claim that Clyde admitted killing Laura Miller. Um, he also acknowledged being familiar with the field where the bodies were found as his company used that field to dump roofing tiles. He was also found guilty of killing Ellen Beeson around the same time. He used to live on the same street as the Millers. So, you know, they say that, you know, um, Laura knew him um, because Laura's boyfriend said that she bought pot from him at least once. Um, he frequented those local bars, including the ones where those ladies had been. Same bars as like Heidi and Audrey. And it can't be verified, but a League City librarian online talked about a frequent patrol who she got to know. And the woman was taking a criminology course with the local law enforcement. And those law enforcement told her that they knew who had committed the murders, but they couldn't prove it. And it, all this said was he frequent, they, all they said was that he frequented the Blue Moon Bar and was currently serving time for another crime. So that does sound like Clyde Kedrick. And for Tim, actually, you know, I can't remember when it happened, but he filed a lawsuit. He was not happy with all of this, and he filed a lawsuit. And actually, I think that led... Okay, is he on now, Alicia? I know, the picture of Clyde is like, ooh, ooh. I'm just doing an overview of this for now. Anyway, you guys, I'm going to cover this. We're going to continue to cover this because it's such a big case that it's going to be really hard to get it all in. Now, as far as the killing fields, there is a movie. Now, I can't remember in the exactly in the movie if they name everyone. Not yet. Okay. Because I wanted to play the one where they found them, at least a little piece of it, and I can play more of it next time. It's going live in two minutes. Okay, I'll just wait and do it next time then. So... Duty Ron is going to go live and give us an update on Na Naomi Erion on her case. Troy Driver, um, I think he had a bail hearing, and I don't think they changed anything on that. Just so y'all know. Um, yeah, that they are beginning to think, oh, we could spend weeks, that's for sure. They are beginning to think that there's more than one player. And that's why I wanted to make sure and let you all know that the FBI has said that they believe these four are the Calder Road murders and that it just happens to be in this area that the media has designated. I got helicopters going over. <laughs> That's just local, guys. 
the media has designated the area as the killing fields. The FBI did not make that designation. So, but I think I covered quite a bit and I think I, hopefully you guys will go over and take a look. Also, I did want to mention before I go, I'm wearing a bracelet that I bought from Duty Ron's website. You can go over there and, and, and buy some bracelets. Um, this is for EquiSearch Midwest. This is to raise money for them. Lost is not alone. And I got that on, and the, the, the link for that is down below. So, you guys, thank you for coming. I know it was heavy. Congratulations to Jeannie when you watch this back. If you do, if you don't, hopefully you'll hear about it. Because I know that a lot of us know, know you in the YouTube streets. And I appreciate you guys so, so much. And we'll go over to Duty Ron and, uh, and see what, what he's got to say about it all. Okay, you guys. Love y'all. And I'll talk to you soon. We'll be doing some updates. And have fun later today. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay, bye y'all.